why don't you give us your name and uh, where you're from and uh, the branch you serve in, and then we can start the story. Yes, he's, I got you it on. All right. When I went in, uh, my name is George Miller, and I'm from Little Falls. I was born and raised in Herkimer. When I got married, I moved there. And I went and I volunteered for the Army when I was 17. And I went to, went to basic down in Virginia, Camp Pickett. And from, from after basic, we come home. And then we was on orders to report back to Lynchburg, Virginia, to go out to Stoneman. That was in California. And from there, we was on orders to go to uh, Japan. So I had a buddy of mine, him and I joined together, and we wanted to stay together. At that time, they had a buddy system. And we signed up for the buddy system. We got over there, and they split us up. We was at Camp Drake. We all fell out. His name was called. He was going to 25th Division. And they called my name. I'm going to 7th Division. Well, he's down south. I'm up in north. So that's where we ended up, and that was in April of 49. And then from April of 49, all the time I was up there, we was doing maneuvers probably two weeks at a time out in, at what we called a... Uh, Ojo Jahara, and we stayed out there two weeks, and then we'd go back into camp for one week, just mainly to clean our gear up, and then we'd go back out again. We'd done that for about 10 months. Then later on in February, I got a call from the company commander to, to report to him, and I went in, and he says, uh, you've been selected to go to NCO school. So I... I says, okay, but I, I was already signed up to, to finish my high school to get my GED, but I had to wait. So I went to NCO school, and that was in April of 49. When I come back out, I made, made the grade a corporal. And then I went back and finished my testing for, got my GED. And I was pulling, pulling different, different grades like sergeants, I had a, had a squad. I was a squad leader at the time, and then they uh, pulled me off, and I was sergeant of the guard. And that was in June 25th. That's when the Chinese come across the border, and we all heard it on the radio, and we was all surprised. Tell me a little more specifically about where you were stationed, so a person can understand. Uh, I was in northern Japan. Uh, northern part of Honshu, which is Sendai, Sendai, Japan. And it was an enclosed camp, but uh, you, every once in a while you got a pass to go out into town. And the town at the, at the time was, it wasn't very nice because it was only four years after the war and there was a lot of, still a lot of buildings down. And over there, they call a banjo a bathroom. And you go into a public bathroom, all it is is a trough. And oh, there's a lot of different things that we would not think of back here in the States would be sanitary, but that's the way they, they lived. And there are open markets. They had fish markets right out in the open and everything. And What was your reaction to that? Well, it, it was... To me, it was, it was, it wasn't really, you know, right to have stuff out in the open. They had fish with the heads on, and they actually ate the fish heads and rice, but I couldn't eat it. And from there, we went. Uh, we would go out on pass now and then, and I happened to get a, a 15-day leave. I think that was back in, oh, I would say October. Yeah, October of uh, 49. I went down to Osaka to visit my buddy that I joined the Army with. Well, I was down there for 15 days with him. And I, I, my hotel was in uh, 
right outside of Nagoya. And that's where one of the one of the bombs hit over there. And uh, I took side trips because he was still training, so during the day I couldn't see him, and I would take the train and go go to different places. And I went to, uh, oh, I can't remember the name now, but uh, where, where they dropped the atomic bomb, I went to, there, went to that town, and you could still see shadows on the walks and against buildings. Some buildings were standing. You could see shadows of people that were standing there when the bomb went off. Hiroshima, that's the name of it. And uh, I didn't get a chance to go to Nagasaki. But I stayed there and visited my friend for 15 days, and then I went, went back to Sendai. And from there, I was pulling my sergeant of the guards every now and then, and whatever the sergeant duties was. And when, when the Korea, Korea started, they, they come in and they took a lot of replacements from our, our division, the 7th Division. First of all, they filled up the 24th, and they sent the 24th over first. And then they come back and they took more out for the, the 1st Cavalry Division and the 25th. They took our division and spread us out over the whole island of Japan. Well, we were stationed way down in the south, it was, the place was Sasebo, that's where the Navy base is. We were stationed there for a few days and then they pulled us out of there and it was a little island between Japan and Korea. We went out on that. We was out there for almost a month. About the 15th of July they pulled us out, took us back up to Mount Fuji because they had a lot of replacements from the states coming over. and. That's where we got all our replacements. And besides the replacements we got, we had Korean soldiers from South Korea come over and was going to train with us. For every man that was in the outfit, they had a man attached to them that was a Korean. And they had to teach them whatever training we had, teach them the training that we had. So we done that for Quite a, quite a while, even we would go out on maneuvers and try to teach them what to do on maneuvers and uh, on patrols and what to do and what to expect and different things like that. And then, then we got ready. In August, they put us on a ship, the latter part of August. We sailed out and we was out out there in, in, in the sea on the ship until September 15th. September 15th, that's when the 7th Division and the Marines went in at uh, Inchon. We was one of the lucky ones. My regiment was in reserve. We went in a day after the Marines went in. And all we was doing was just mop, just mop up. Tell going, us about what that, what that whole battle was like. Well, it was, when you first went in, you had, you had to go, a big stone wall you had to go up. The wall was about 10 foot high. You had to put ladders up. And you had to climb over the wall. Well, we was one of the lucky ones because there was no firing when we went in. The Marines had already pushed them out. And we was going house to house to clean up snipers and w what was remaining there. And then we fought. They pushed us up from reserve, pushed us up into the fight, and we was fighting into Seoul. Once, once they got Seoul, that's when MacArthur brought Sigmund Rhee back over, and they had a big ceremony there, giving them back the city and everything. And in the meantime, they pulled us back, the 17th Infantry Regiment, the whole regiment went back, and we was getting ready to get back on ship. They put us on a ship, now this was in the latter, no, the first part of October. And they were still debating what to do, but they took the Marines on one ship and we was on another ship. And we had to go around the whole circle of the island. And the Marines went up north to a, a, a town called Wansan. 
The Marines went in there, but there was no resistance because the ROK outfits had already been through there. They'd been pushing the, pushing the North Koreans back so fast that they was already there by the time the Marines landed. What are the ROK outfits? Pardon? The ROK outfits. That's uh, Rock. It's uh, Republic of Korea. Okay. So their own people. They're, yeah. They, were they, they had their own, they had their own uh, divisions. Okay. And uh, we went on about 100 miles north of Wonsan to a place called Iwan. And we landed at Iwan on October 29th. And we didn't hit any, hardly any resistance whatsoever. And we went on a, like a forced march. We was going 25 miles a day. And we kept doing that for a number of days until we got to the border. We hit Haesan Jin. We was there around the 21st of November when we hit when we hit Haesan Jin. And you could look across the look across the river, and you could see the Chinese walking guard duty. And they had these long gray coats on. We all thought they was Russians at first, but then it turned out it was the North, North uh, or the Chinese. And all the, the North Koreans had pushed over the border, and that's where they stayed. So we couldn't go across the border. So we stayed there, and we, they flew in Thanksgiving dinner to us on the 25th. And by the time we got it, it was cold, but it, at least it was something better than sea rations. And while I was eating that, the photographer come over and asked if he could take my picture. And I said, yes, you could. So I'm still chewing on the turkey leg, and he takes my picture. That picture is in uh, a lot of documentaries of the Korean War, and it's also in that one that was on the History Channel of Fire and Ice. And later on, I found out after the war, in 1995, my picture was on the magazine, the VFW magazine. And that's a friend of mine called me up and told me that my picture was on it. And I says, nah. Yeah, he says, yes. He says, look at it. And I looked it over and I said, sure enough, it was. So when we went down to the Washington for the memorial, I found out my picture was on the wall. I had to go over and see it. So. Well, getting back to the story, uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself, but after, after we got the recruits from, from uh, the states to come over, we was on ship walking around. This is before we went in at Inchon. I walked up to this guy, and he looked familiar, and I says, isn't your name McKinney? And he says, yeah. I says, you're from Herkimer. He says, yeah. So him and I was in the same battalion, he was in D Company, I was in A Company. And a lot of times, he would be my forward observer. He would come up and stay with me. And we were both from the same town. And now getting back to where I was, up at Haesan Jin, after we had that, had that turkey dinner, it was only about two or three days later, about the 27th, the Chinese started hitting us. And that's when we had to leave leave there, and we wanted to get back down south because at the time they said the, there were so many divisions coming in and they didn't want to get behind us. So we had to take what we could, and what we couldn't take, we had to blow up. There was a lot of ammo dumps. We couldn't carry them out. Didn't have enough vehicles to get them out. So they blew them up, and, and anything that got stuck on the way going down, if you couldn't get it out, you blew it up. So we fought our way back to, to Hung Nan. And when we got down to Hung Nan, Hung Nan, there was a big battle there before we got into the town. And we was on a hill on a, on a ridge. It was going up like this, and I was on the side of the ridge. And we had to dig a foxhole. We was in a foxhole. And we, we knew the Chinese was trying to get around us. Well, they happened to get around a, a, a rock outfit that was to our left, and they circled around in back of us and got got to our headquarters, our company headquarters, 
they took our company commander's Jeep, which had a 50 caliber on it. Now, I was in the foxhole with a friend of mine that I, he, I was in Japan with him all the time from April of 49, right? And that same day, that Chinese got the Jeep, fired that 50, and hit my buddy right in the head. And I was next to him, and I figured myself, I was very lucky, but I wished it wasn't him. And that was one of, one of the bad days that I had over there. And then from there, we finally got, finally broke loose and got out of there, got through the Chinese in the back, and got into Hung Nam. And we was there in December, first part of December, we got aboard ship, and they took us down to Pusan. From Pusan, we got back onto tra uh, trains. Well, they're like box cars because everybody had to stand up in them. And they took us up to Tegu. Well, we was up there. We spent Tegu. We spent uh, Christmas and New Year's in a temple up there. There wasn't any fighting then. We was getting ready to start going north again. So we pushed ourselves, pushed on after New Year's, started pushing north. We had a, quite a few battles. There was one night we had a, a bayonet charge, and we had to fight with bayonets. My, my division was awarded the, a bayonet emblem with the 7th Division on it. And in one of them battles, a friend of mine got bayoneted in the stomach. And then from there, he went back to the aid station. I, get, I never saw him again. And then we kept fighting, kept fighting north, and we got up near the 38th parallel. There was a little town called Chip Yan Ni. And there was about two divisions of Chinese in there. And we had to fight up, going uphill. And as we was going up the hill, they was rolling grenades down at us. And one grenade come right between my legs, and I turned my body quick, and I had my rifle, and I turned, and that thing, that grenade exploded, and I was lucky it didn't hit nothing but my hand and my rifle. And a buddy of mine that was on the right of me, he got the concussion from it and a lot of the shrapnel. He rolled down the other side of the hill and I, I laid unconscious and right there where I, where I was hit. Well, later on I found out that he rolled down the wrong side of the hill. He was captured. And I never heard any more from him. He, he was, his name was never on the list of coming home. All I know is his, his name is still down in, on the, in the computer down in Washington. The day he died, they, he was captured, and about three weeks after he was captured, he died from the wounds. And from there, I kept, when I, when I come to, I got up and I started, kept on going up the hill, and my company commander saw that I was saw that I was bleeding, and he says, you get back to the aid station. So I went back to the aid station, which was about three miles back, and there was a guy from C Company that was blinded, and I had to, had to help him back. Well, back at the aid station, I was there for about a day, and then the next day they come and told me that I was going to be flown, flown on a plane back to Japan to Kobe. I was in the hospital in Kobe, Japan for about three to four weeks. They was treating me for frostbite in the hospital, plus my wound. It was just, they was worried about a spring offensive, and they wanted to get everybody back that could fire a rifle, so they took, had me go out, and a buddy of mine, his name was Foresight, and he was from one of the other regiments, he was still in the cast on his leg, and I still had my arm in a sling, and they sent us back to Korea. Well, when I got back over to 
in China at the Repo Depot. That's a receiving center. They told me not to, that my MOS was being changed, that I couldn't go back to the front line, that I was going to be stationed there at the, at the receiving center. So I stayed there at the receiving center the rest of my tour in, in Korea. And from day to day, I had to ship, get the guys that was coming in and get the guys that was going out and, and make a manifest, telling them where they're going and, and make sure that they got there. And there was trucks coming and going all the time, picking men up and taking them out. And that was my job until August of uh, 51, and they come and told me that I was on, on the rotation list and I was coming home. How did that feel? That felt good coming home. But I come home and I went in uh, Seattle, Washington. September 15th we landed there. And then we was uh, put, on a, put on a troop train to come back to the States. Well, I had to go all the way back through. I even had a train take me right straight through Herkimer and I couldn't stop because I was going to Fort Devens of Massachusetts. So when I got to Fort Devens, they give us a give us a 30 day leave and then I come back home. All I'd done was went in and got off the bus right outside of the laundry where my father worked. He was he was a dry cleaner. I went in and saw my father and he says, I'll meet you in a little while. I went across the street to the bar and I waited for my father to come out. And then after my 30 days, I went back to uh, Fort Devens and I was stationed there as a cadre. I was training, I was training uh, new recruits for the, the first three days they was in and then when they got assigned a different, different post, Different ones was picked to, to take them to that post and then come back. And I went on different trips. I was went on a trip down to to uh, New Jersey, and I had another trip down to South Carolina to Fort Jackson. And that's the only two trips that I had. But I was ready to re-enlist for six for six more years because I was ready to go up to master sergeant and. I was told if I re-enlisted, I might get it. So I come home on leave after that, and I told my wife, I, and in the meantime, I got married. When did, you, did you get married while you were home on the other leave? No, I, I, was marri I married at 17 before I went in. So you left your wife? Yeah. Tell me some more about, about what was going on at home and who you left behind when you went home. Well, when you went, I'm sorry, when you went over there. When I first went over? Yeah. When I first went over, I, well, I had a family. My, uh, I had brothers and sisters, which was nine of them, besides myself. And my father worked in the laundry, and my mother worked in uh, what they called an egg factory. It was making egg crates. It, uh, that's, and I had to get permission to get married. I was only 17, my wife was only 16. She got pregnant. She had, a, she had the boy when I was over in Korea. And I didn't, I've never, I didn't see him until I come home. So how long was that? 51, he was, he was already walking, walking around by the time I got home. He was born in January of 50, and I come home in... Uh, September, September of 50. So he was walking and my wife talked me out of not reading the list. She just says, no, she says, you're only guaranteed nine months back in the States and then they can ship you back to Korea, which that's, that was told to me. Being, a, being my high, high rank that I would be back, back over in Korea. So she says, no, she says, I don't want you to go. So I went back and told my company commander, and he had all the papers filled out. All I had to do was sign them. I, I guess he got so mad at me, he shipped me out to Camp Drum. <laughs> and I was stationed up to Camp Drum in a, in a regular rifle outfit. And I was first field sergeant up there. 
until I got discharged. I was held over. I was supposed to get discharged in January, but I got held over until June because of the Truman year. At that time, Truman tacked a year on everybody. So I, I only pulled five months, almost six months' time extra. So I was in three and a half years. And when I got home, I was real happy. How about the adjustment when you got home? Because you went from place to place and, and yeah. the battles you saw and the friends you lost. Well, it, it was it was hard. It was hard when I when I first come home. My wife couldn't touch me because uh, I would I would jump up and start fighting and start looking for my rifle. And I wasn't the only one. There was a lot of us in the same thing. Still, I, still to this day, I have flashbacks of different things that happened. Right now, I'm going to. Rome, I have to go up there once a month. There's a group of us. It's mostly Korean veterans. We have a group of about eight people that goes up there, have an hour session with this, this service officer, and we have to tell him, we talk our stories out. And it tries to he tries to relieve us of all, all the stuff that we're trying to remember. But it's hard. It still comes back. Yeah, I did. Yes, I went. I went away a boy and come back a man. Because you have to grow up fast. Because I was in Korea at 18 years old. And how did you adjust to the culture difference? Uh, because if you were from small town, yeah, uh, what was it like to go to this new place, a different culture? Well. It, it, it was it, some of it was amazing, really, to see some of the some of the big cities. And uh, when I got over to Japan, it was it was different, different to what I've seen in the states. But when I was, first went in, and I'm on the troop train going down through, to we went down to Richmond, Virginia. That's where Camp Pickett is, and. I was amazed when I got to Virginia and I seen all this red clay because we don't have red clay in up up north, <laughs> and it's, it's quite a difference. Yeah. You said something when you were talking about going through uh, the different battles and where you've been to, so many different places. But you said something about when what the Americans and the South Koreans um, had taken over Seoul, had gotten and, 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 and retaken Seoul. Was that it? Yeah, they retook it. Twice. In fact, I think that we had to fight for it three different times for Seoul. But my outfit only fought once for Seoul. What was that victory like? Victory taking Seoul was, to us, we were still mopping up when uh, MacArthur was saying the city is taken. We were still shooting, shooting enemies in town going from house to house and to us it was the same thing I mean it, it might have been back in the states they might have put it back in the, in the newspapers back here and on the media that uh, it's all well and good the town is taken but it wasn't not, not, not at that time because we were still fighting for it and we had to we had to get the, some of the, some of the riffraff out of the houses because they, they would stay in the house and they see, see anybody moving out on the street, they would shoot them. So we'd have to go from house to house to get them out. And it, well, a lot of times you didn't know who you was fighting. We was on roadblocks, on like a, especially there was one, a long bridge. It was over the Han River and thousands and thousands of refugees coming through and the women had these great big bundles on their head and they wanted us to search every one of them. Well, you couldn't search every one of them. And there was still a lot of enemy infiltrated right in with them. They put the, took their uniforms off and put civilian clothes on and infiltrated right behind, behind us and they would open up at night. Some of the women would even carry uh, grenades in, in them bundles and some of them had mortars in there, the small mortars. 
and they'd open up at night on us. And we'd be, we didn't know who we was fighting, actually. And it was, it was really, really a tough war over there because you didn't know who you, who you was fighting against. South Korean looked just like a North Korean. How, were, you, um, were you well received by the South Koreans, though? And they knew you were helping them, but really, did they adjust? Some, them? some, not all. A lot of them, a lot of them praised us, and a lot of them, a lot of them would spit on us. And I met after when I com after I got a job in uh, Remington Arms. I met a girl that was only three years old that was from Seoul, Korea. And she's over, she married a GI and was brought back here. And she was working with me. And the, the videos that I, uh, that I took, had, that I showed her and showed her my picture. And she wanted the videos. She wanted to make copies of them. So, and she came back and thanked me. And not only for the videos, but thanked me for saving her family over there <laughs> which was which was a good thing i mean we wasn't we wasn't thanked too much back when we come home neither not by our own people because nobody thought it was a war it was a police action they didn't respond the same then after all the world war ii and then right five years later we go over there and fight and it was not a war it was a police action which to me as far as I was concerned, it was the Korean War because there was a lot of them killed over there. When your, um, when your buddies uh, were killed, how difficult that was for you? Right? It, it was real tough, real tough when my friends got killed. Yeah. You'd get new replacements in after some of your friends would die and you'd want to shy away from them. You didn't want to get to know them. You, you try to tell them to keep their head down, keep their cool, and play smart and do what they was told. But you didn't want to get attached to them because it was too hard losing friends. Because being in Japan all them months before the Korean War, us guys used to go out and party and drink beer, play cards. And then, the, then the, some of them get killed, captured. And it was hard. That's why you'd, once you once you get to be an NCO, you don't want to get attached to your men anyways, because you got to give them orders all the time, and you can't have no favoritism. When you uh, lost your friends, it seemed like you were shipped on and out and move into the next city very quickly. Yes. It really didn't give you time to grieve. No, no, you still. You still, you could remember it, yes, because I still remember it today. But uh, at that time, we was getting surrounded by Chinese, and you had to think of yourself to get out of there, you and your, your men. And what you would do is just go about your business, what you had to do that, from day to day. And... If you got into reserve, then you would stop and stop and start thinking of stuff of what happened. But when you was in battle, you didn't think of it. You had to you had to think of trying to save yourself and the men. What do you? What, you said that you even uh, today you would have flashbacks and things. You had to adjust to that all these years. I'm still I still today. It. Uh, Different things happened that when my buddy got hit with that 50 in the head, all I, I was right next to him and all I heard was thud. And today I can still hear that noise. And some of the bayonet charges and you hear them whistles and them bugles going off, coming at you. And that, that was the way the Chinese signaled with whistles and bugles. They had all different kinds of single signals on them. And when you heard them, that stays with you, especially when you had to fight hand to hand. And we, we had to fight about three different times myself before I got wounded hand to hand. 
because they got it behind you to, and it, you had men in front of you fighting and men behind you fighting you. You had to fight, fight your way out. And the biggest, biggest word over there was bug out. If they got, got in behind you, you had to bug out and get out of there. As a lot of them say it's, it was a retreat, but it wasn't really a retreat because you were still fighting both ways. What do you think at that time gave you the greatest strength? What about yourself made you get through that? Oh, when you had a chance to go to church, the chaplain would come around and even even get a bunch of men on, under a bunch of trees and he would say prayers you'd go to the, you'd go to the mass or go to your services whichever whichever whatever you was if you was catholic or, or protestant myself i didn't care i'd go to both of them if one if a catholic priest come i'd i'd go with that bunch and it made you feel better and it's about the only way you can get your strength back is believe in god Yep. And then uh, you came back to your wife and you said the adjustment was hard. Mm -hmm. Now what about your family life from, from then on? Well, when I first come home, I got a, got a job in the early 50s when I got out. In 54, yeah, the year of 54, I got a job on the canal pouring cement, building uh, the new, new uh walls for them. Well, I worked about three weeks on that and I had to quit because of the frostbite. And, and then I got a job. From there I went into uh, what they called National Automotive Fibers. That's in Little Falls. I worked there until they closed up and it was only a couple, just a couple of years there and then I got a job up Chicago Nomadic. I worked in Chicago Nomadic but I didn't like driving that far so I got a job at Remington Rand, doing the same thing I was doing up there. I was working, started out as a, a molder in a foundry. So I got a job, same thing down in Ilion, which was closer to home, and it was a little bit more money. And I worked there. The first five years, I think I worked in Remington Rand and Univac. It turned into Univac after. I worked there f five years. I think I was laid off seven times. But I finally, every time I come back, I got a different job. I got out of the foundry and I went up to, uh, got into the machines. And I got on the drill line and then from the drill line I went on to what they called the uh, uh, Canton Bore, which was a level 10. And that was a lot more money. So I worked there until, until I got laid off in 1970. No, 71 I got laid off. And then I went on unemployment. And then I got a job in Remington Arms. And in Remington Arms, most of the time I was in there, I worked for Remington for 23 and a half years. And I was a polisher in the arms. Now what about your family? Uh, did you uh, have one, well you had the one? Family. I had the boy and then we had three girls after that. My wife and I had six children all together but she had she had RH negative blood and we had trouble with every one of our children except for the last one and we lost two in between back in the 50s and 54 and 55 we lost two and then we had had another one she was all right and then the last one was all right and today I've got the three daughters my son died at 48 with cancer and last April I lost my wife Well, I never, 
I never really told my family about any of the experience I went through. They, I don't think they could, could have comprehended what I, what I was trying to tell them. And even today, you can talk about it to different ones, but you've got to talk to somebody that's been there. That's why we had the group up in Rome. And we all go up there, and we can all talk about the stuff that we've gone through. And my friend Carl McKinney from Herkimer here, he's in that group. He was in the bayonet charges. You'll probably see him later on in here. We was hoping we'd come together, but it didn't happen. <laughs> um, what would you, uh, okay, do you have any grandchildren? I have uh, 12 grandchildren, eight great-grandchildren right now. Well, some of them do know. I've got a grandson, grandson that was in the, was in the Seabees for five years, and he's he's seen action over in Haiti. He was he was uh, building a hospital over in Haiti, and they was firing at him all the time. So he knows what it is, and I I can talk to him. And my my son-in-law, one son-in-law, well I. Both son-in-laws, never, neither one of them was in the service, and the other son-in-law, he was, he was over there in Germany, but he was never in action. And I, I can't talk to none of them about what I went through. Uh, they read books, and then they'll come and ask me questions about different things, and then, then I can tell them different things that happened. Like I got one son-in-law, he's nothing but a bookworm. And he, any book that I get about the Korean War, he wants, and he reads it. And then he'll come back and ask me questions about it. So at least they're interested. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're interested. But uh, I don't think they could comprehend some of the stuff that we went through. Do you think war will be different now? Yeah, yeah. I think it will be. It'll be a lot different war. I don't think there's uh, going to be so much hands-on in this war if they go into Iraq, as there was when we was fighting. Technology changes. Yeah. Tell me about your shirt. Well, this picture was put on the wall down in Washington. And I've I seen a lot of people when I was down there for the ceremonies wearing this shirt, and I'd go up to them and say, you got my shirt on. <laughs> And then they'd ask me, and I'd tell them, that, well, that was my picture. And they shook my hand, and they was glad to know that the person they're wearing on the shirt is they met. And talking to, about the, the Koreans, I was down to uh, Washington. Oh, this was about two years after the wall was put up. I got a, one granddaughter lives down in Washington, D.C., and I go down quite often and visit her, and we go over to the wall. Well, this one day, it was in the summertime, and there was quite a few tourists around, and I was trying, trying to take pictures of my grandchildren standing in front of it, in front of my picture. Well, I was all out of film. Well, this Korean come by, and he was asking me questions about it, and I told him that that was my picture, and I told him I wanted to take pictures. I didn't run out of film. He'd give me a roll of film to put in my camera. <laughs> so that, I thought that was pretty nice. If, uh, if you could say something to young people today, um, because uh, they, like you said, they just don't, they don't know, they don't understand. No. Um, why did it all have to happen and was it worth it? Why did the war happen? Why did it have to happen? You know, why, uh, why did you have to go? Why did we have what to What good is it for them these days? Well, <laughs> fighting communists, if you didn't, communists would be over here and you wouldn't have no democracy. You wouldn't have no free speech. You can see the same thing going on in Iraq right today. Then people don't have nothing to say. Everybody's a scare. That's the way this would be over here. So 
if uh, World War II and Korea, I think, is the ones that really set the pace for communists to knock it out. And now today, you got Russia. Russia's changing a lot from World War II. So, I think it was great that we went over there and it had to be done. Whether a lot of guys got killed or not, we still had to be there. So it was worth it. Yes, I think it was worth it. At least a lot of my grandchildren didn't have to go. That's, that's the main thing. I hate to see any young kid go over there today. Back then instead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about if we look at some of the things that you did? All right. Okay. All right. Boy, you've been through so much. Yeah. What? Uh, I'm so sorry about your wife. You had quite a few years together, huh? Yeah, 53. These are some pictures of a, a friend of mine sent me that was in my regiment, but he was in a different company. And I met him down in Washington, and he sent these pictures to me. Now, this is uh, when we was wait, on... Wait a second. Wade, will you, be, will you be able to take yeah. them from here, or do you want me to bring a music stand up and just kind of line them up? That would be the best. Thing. Okay. We're gonna, I'm going to put a music stand right here. And that's, uh, that's a picture of when we was... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Nice doc recording. That's good. Uh, let me just so that we know what they are, he can tell you. He can tell you. He can take the voice. Uh, that first picture uh, by the tent is when we was on bivouac in uh, Ojo Jahara. That was before the Korean War. And the other picture is uh, one of the lakes right near there. I don't know what it is. Post, Post Camp Schimmelflinning is the name of it. That was up in Sendai, Japan. You want these? These are more of them. There's a, a barracks at Shimmel Binning, and that's, that's Lloyd Pittman and F Company. I don't, I don't remember. The third one again, the one with the cannon. Can I get, can I, get, can I see it? Shimmer. Or Camp Schimmelflinning. Schimmelflinning. That's in Sendai, Japan. All right. I'll replace them. Put these two here, okay? This is, I should take it off. There's the gentleman. Take this off of here. And what's that one over there, George? Oh, this is Pittman, too. This was at this was at Shibbleton in forty nine. Oh, okay. These the barracks are behind them, you could see yeah. that. There's barracks. And then this is another sh close up of barracks, right? Okay, yeah. well let them take those shots and then you can uh, the voice that explains it. The first one I see is him uh, with all the barracks. First one is uh, a friend of mine that was in F Company. He was from upstate New York here. And his name is Lloyd Pittman. He was in F Company at Schimmelflinning. And he's the one that sent these pictures to me. And the other pictures, one of the barracks. What's the last one? Over. Yeah. There you go. Just let me do something. Okay. What was the barracks one? shot? He's just going to oh, he's good. Do you want to put that one on alone? Okay, we have a real good one here we need to show you. 
That's definitely the adventure shot, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. This. Me, want me to move it over, Wade? Because there's these little things here. Would you like me to move it there? Does it help? Yeah, that's good. Okay. What's this one? How uh, this picture here is the another regiment in our in our division. That's the 31st. They they landed at Iwan on uh, November 5th. This is, they was the ones that was in reserve after us. We went in the 29th of uh, October. Yeah, these are the pictures on yeah, the wall. Yeah, this one's not going to reproduce very well, well. That one on this oh, one. Oh, I, I don't know if that will. This is what's on his shirt there. I don't know if that will reproduce well. We'll see. And what's on the wall. That's the actual image from the wall. Which way might produce well enough. Oh, that might be good. Actually, you can dissolve from this one or something like that. Mm -hmm. You can use that in a soft edge white. Got that one? And this was with, this is you and your... Uh, this is my wife and my two grandchildren. I took down there to show them. To show them the wall. There's the picture in the middle of it. I'll tell you, when I take my kids there, I'm going to show them your picture. <laughs> You'll have to walk down the whole length of the wall. I will. It's way down on the... Way down there, it's probably about the sixth or seventh from the end. And really? Is that? Well, I'm going to blast you again. Pretty incredible. I got it. So I got it. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's excellent. And they were also, they, you were also featured on this magazine. Yeah. Yeah, this is the featured magazine, the VFW magazine, where his picture was there, too. I'm trying to hold it back. i just put the magazine up there, and you can actually kind of, I don't know if you can tell it down to a weight. That's quite a feat. Yeah. You have to do that. You have to do your fancy, uh, I don't have any fancy, fancy, fancy camera work. Well, let me turn the... I'm just going to bend it back the other way. Yeah. The fanciness is quickly leaving me. Did it? Yep, we did. Okay. Let me take the whole shot. Okay. That was that was actually taken in uh, July, June and July issue of 1995. That was. Mm. Yeah, we even have the. You can see that there. The uh, date. Do we have a couple of are there any of those that we're really interested in? I don't know if you can see them. Or, so a lot of them are small pictures. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but some of this stuff is. I love this one where you're... I got it. I got it. Oh, okay, okay. See, these are, some of these shots are pretty incredible, but I don't know what we're going to do with them. I think we'd need to copy stand them. It would take a long time yeah. to do it. See, like this, he's next to the, this is a gun of sort. What did you call That's this one? 57 a recoilless 50. weapon. Guys that they were in Korea must be in yeah. there, not the bottom. These are all these are all the guys that were in Korea. Yeah, they was all yeah. that was they was attached to us. They were attached to you, yeah. okay. And the other page across from it is also I see all the yeah. guys up the front. Yeah. yeah. Maybe if you can uh, give me that kind of scrapbook study or something. Try the other the other page being attached to Yeah, this is a tough piece Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just try that. Even that's kind of a 
That's a great shot. Got a very nostalgic look and everything. Uh, a sense of camaraderie that you talked about, Oscar. I think there's a little less time in the cabin room. There is a picture, a smaller picture of me in that group there. Is it the one down there? No, it's, I think it's on another page. Okay. We'll find that one. We'll just take a few of these because then we get the whole idea mm -hmm. of what it looked like. We can use them. And then we'll find the one um, that has you in it All especially. Right. Gosh, we'd love to take every one of them. As far as names. There's only a very few of them I can remember. Oh, I imagine. <laughs> I know, I can hardly remember some of my students from a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> is your last name Carol? My last name is, my first name is Mary Ann. And Bill? No, I'm not. Um, people wonder if I'm uh, Yeah, Bill's I was wondering if you're related. <laughs> or so, no, I worked with Bill at WKPV okay. many years ago. Oh. My husband worked there at the same time as well, which was funny. There were three of us Carols working there. <sighs> and so a lot of people have thought that Bill's my husband. My, I had a granddaughter interned up there. Really? When was that? What's her name? Ter Teresa Miller. <gasps> Teresa Miller! Yeah. She was my, she was my <laughs> student here. Yeah. Yeah. Right here at the college? Yeah, she's pregnant now. Is she? She just called me last week. Where is she? She's down in Virginia. Is she really? Yeah. yeah. Where in Virginia? Uh, Gainesville. Really? It's just south of uh, Leesburg. Oh, I would love to get in touch with Teresa. <laughs> she was wonderful. <laughs> had a good job. <laughs> if it wasn't for you. Pretty good, though. It's pretty good. Did you, you got those? Am I on the one on the right? The little one on the right. Oh, okay. oh yeah, that's a nice shot of you. Mm. That's good. Handsome young man there. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. <laughs> Still. Now, uh, I was looking over. What are these? This uh, ten cents. Ten yen. Ten dollar bill, you get a whole pocket full. <laughs> when we, when I was in Japan in '49, it was three hundred and sixty, three hundred and sixty yen to a dollar. So you would get a whole pocket. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> It's a pleasure to talk to you and to see